Okay, very good. Um, so again, what we're talking about in these lectures, or what I'm talking about, I guess, in these lectures is quantum entanglement and the tools that we have to work with entanglement or, or make it a quantitative uh, entity. And so I spent two lectures talking about entanglement entropy. Um, but as you guys said, I want to switch gears and, and start talking about something else, in particular complexity. Um, entanglement entropy has been around for over a decade now. Complexity has uh, just entered the game, or our sphere of, on, on HEP TH, our sphere of consciousness in the past couple of years. Uh, and so this is, uh, well, there's a lot of, I think, exciting things to be done here and uh, research that's going on. Um, but I should start by asking, what is complexity? Well, it is what it sounds like. It's how hard is it to do something? How hard is it to uh, organize a summer school? How hard is it to find the train station? Uh, but for us, the question will be, how hard is it to prepare a particular state in my quantum theory? And we're going to use, a, to make that quantitative, we're going to use what's called the quantum circuit model. And so we're going to start with a reference state that's just, by definition, some simple state. And we might have different standards for what simple is. But let's say I had a chain of spins, so I could start with a state where it's all spins down. Then I want to prepare this state over here, and so there's certainly a unitary transformation through the Hilbert space that'll take me from my reference state over here. But I want to do that in a systematic way, and so I have a set of rules that say that I can build that unitary from a certain set of building blocks, or, or Lego blocks here, a certain set of simple gates which typically, in, in, in a situation like this, where I have a chain of spins, I think of them as acting on one or, or possibly a couple of spins at a time, rather than acting on the whole system. And so the idea is that I'm going to have these Lego blocks, and I'm going to put them together in an interesting way, um, like this, to get me from my reference state to my target state. Now, if I have discrete uh, gates, which do fixed um, transformations on pairs or, or perhaps triples or single spins, I might not get exactly to the desired target state, but I'll get very close if I work hard enough. And so in, in the full problem that the quantum information theorists often think about, they'll also introduce a tolerance. Um, they'll have some kind of measure and then a, a tolerance as to uh, you know when they declare success, when their uh, transformation has succeeded in producing the desired state. And then given that circuit, what we do is we just count up all the gates in the circuit, and that then is what we call uh, the complexity or the circuit complexity of uh, this particular state preparation. Now, one of the things you might ask is, it seems like in my description, I was saying we had to make a lot of different choices. And so you might make different choices than I do, say, for the reference state. You might pick a different tolerance. Depending on our backgrounds, we may choose different sets of gates uh, with which to build our circuits. And so a natural question is, you know, is the answer we're going to get for the complexity going to depend on those different choices? And the answer is, of course it does. Uh, it's, it's clear that that's going to happen. Um, and that, that may be somewhat alarming or, or disconcerting to some of us, but I think it's just that complexity is a different kind of a beast uh, that we have to, you know, grow to love or grow to admire. Um, and, you know, our computations are different people may do different computations. Presumably we're not going to prepare a single state. What we're going to do, we're going to look at families of states or families of operations. And we'll all have our own set of numbers, but then the question is going to be, is there some kind of robust physical information that's contained in those sets of numbers? 
Or alternatively, you know, what kinds of questions can I answer with this kind of computation or calculation? Um, certainly I can't, uh, well, there will be questions which are uh, so refined that uh, we're just going to disagree on what the answer is. But we'll find, uh, well, we'll find in the holographic example anyway, that there are computations or calculations uh, that, that yield sort of robust information. Um, another comment here is that, um, you know, again, what we're doing uh, is following in the footsteps of the condensed matter theorists. Uh, they've already been here. Um, and you might find in the literature some discussion, often they don't talk about complexity, they talk about something called circuit depth. Um, but what they were doing, uh, or the kinds of discussions that I've seen, are uh, comparisons of different kinds of phases. For example, Jaume was talking about topological phases. Um, and what you can imagine is uh, preparing the ground state of your favorite Hamiltonian from some simple reference state. And you can, you can imagine that if there's, um, it's a gap state and it's trivial, that I, I don't have to work that hard. All of the entanglements will be short range. And so I'll only need uh, a few gates per site, uh, as it were. Um, on the other hand, if there's some kind of hidden entanglement that extends over long ranges in the system, uh, I'm going to need to work a lot harder uh, if my gates only act on pairs of spins at a time to establish entanglements between sites at one end of the chain, say, the sites at the other end of the chain. And, and so you may find discussions of this kind uh, in various places in the kinetic matter. Um, but why did it enter, uh, you know, discussions on FTH? We had this beautiful tool, holographic entanglement entropy. We were learning all sorts of things about gravity, about quantum field theory. But then a few years ago, uh, Lenny wrote an interesting paper. He's a man for a slogan, and so the title of his paper was Entanglement is Not Enough. Um, what he really meant was entanglement entropy is not enough. And this is a point that I emphasized, uh, or I mentioned in passing at least at the beginning of my lectures. Entanglement entropy is only one measure of entanglement. It does a job, it does a marvelous job in certain situations, but there are lots of other measures um, that perhaps are going to be important in fully understanding uh, the entanglement or the role of entanglement in holography or in gravity. Um, but in particular, the, the, the problem or the question uh, that Lenny was interested, or Susskind was interested in, was trying to understand uh, what's going on behind the horizon of a black hole? And so, inspired by Shiraz's lecture, I thought that since I'm giving a lecture about black holes, I should write down a metric. So there's the metric of my favorite ADS uh, black hole. Um, I'm drawing a, a silly cartoon here. Why is that a cartoon of a black hole? Well, I'm not sure who needs this, but I thought I'd put it up there. Um, this is a Penrose diagram. The vertical lines here indicate asymptotic ADS boundaries. Uh, the dramatic red line at the bottom and the top are singularities in the future and in the past. Uh, the trick with Feynman, uh, Penrose diagrams, rather, of course, is that null rays travel at 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. And really, all that I'm drawing here is the RT part of the space at each point there's, I imagine that there's a whole sphere worth of points there. And so these eternal black holes always come with a diagram with an X in the middle, and that X is the horizon. Um, further, in the context of ADS-CFT, we think of this uh, geometry as describing the thermal field double. And so I said that I had two ADS boundaries, and so we can think that there are two sets of, or two conformal field theories worth of degrees of freedom, i.e. there's a conformal field theory on the left and the right, and that what this geometry describes is what's called the thermal field double, and so 
it's some kind of entangled state between those two, the left and the right, with certain weighting factors. Um, of course, in the context of this double uh, Hilbert space, this is a pure state. There is no entanglement entropy, or, or it is pure state. On the other hand, the point of building this state is I can integrate out or trace over one of the sets of degrees of freedom. And then what I'm left with is the usual thermal density matrix. And now, of course, there's an entropy that's associated with that density matrix. But as I described yesterday, we can think of that entropy as the entanglement entropy between these two sets of degrees of freedom. Uh, so I, I think that was all review, but let me pause there and ask if there are any questions about that. Excellent, it was all review. Okay, so what was Lenny on about? Well, he was saying uh, that, you know, if the only diagnostic I'm playing with is entanglement entropy, then I'm not going to be able to figure out, you know, the details or the, you know, exciting physics that might be happening behind the horizon. And so as an example, this is just an example, this isn't a proof, but it's an example. Let's think about an entanglement entropy problem where my region, my inside, actually contains pieces on both sides. So that's the, the cross-section in the RT plane. If I open up the R, uh, this blue slide, or this um, Cauchy surface in the bulb, here's uh, the left boundary, say, and the right boundary. And so A has a component on both sides. And if A is, uh, if those uh, regions are big enough on both sides, when I look for the extremal surface, the extremal surface actually dives down through the Einstein-Rosen bridge and connects on the other side. And so this extends all the way across the geometry, and I'm, in principle, finding out or I'm able to probe what's going on uh, anywhere. Well, I, I should see effects of, for instance, um, galaxies, stars, spaceships, wandering through that time slice anywhere uh, in the space-time. Um, now, what I can do, though, is I can imagine that I'm going to push these two regions up to later times in the conformal field theory. And if I do that, I should go the other way, um, then that uh, you know, then this extremal surface stretches out and it starts to probe this region behind the horizon. And it's because I'm probing there that I know that space-time behind the horizon is pink, it's not black at all. Um, crowd, okay. <laughs> uh, but if I keep doing that, pushing A and A prime further and further up in the time, a funny thing happens. In fact, the extremal surface, the smallest surface, actually just connects the region on either side. And so in some sense, there's a phase transition in the entanglement entropy, or that's what sometimes people talk about. It's really that you're trading saddle points. And so this is the dominant saddle point when I extremize over all possible surfaces. But now, these surfaces aren't probing at all what's going on behind the horizon. And that actually happens fairly quickly. It happens on a time scale that's roughly the thermal time scale or some number times the, the thermal time scale. And I can just keep going up. Uh, I can go up. And in fact, those surfaces aren't changing at all until the entanglement entropy doesn't change at all, no matter what I do in pushing it up and down. And so we've not been able to really probe in that experiment, although I could see the spaceships and what they were doing on the initial time slice, I, I really can't see what's happening uh, when they travel through far enough behind, or uh, some distance behind the horizon. And so, I just want to remind you that the, the uh, entanglement entropy and the Rayleigh entropies, in fact, are a set of probes that are telling us about, um, or they're sensitive to, the eigenvalues of our density matrix. Remember, I wrote this formula, but the way that I was supposed to interpret it was as this sum over eigenvalues. 
there's a lot more structure than the eigenvalues in the density matrix. And so what we really want is some kind of a probe that's, uh, well, sensitive to that extra structure. <laughs> and so Lenny's answer was holographic complexity. But, you know, why complexity? Why did he jump on that idea? Well, let's think about complexity a little bit. I mean, this is just a warm-up at the top. If we think about a set of classical bits or classical spins, say, in your laptop, um, I can think about how hard it is, or I can, I can ask for the complexity to build a certain bit string from a reference string where they're all zeros. And the way I'm going to operate in that classical world is I just, I'm going to flip each individual bit that needs to be flipped. And that'll be my essential gate or my essential operation. Um, and if I think about it and I ask, you know, what's the, well, I'll say the words anyway and you can ask a question because there's caveats here, but um, if I ask what's the maximum complexity, I'll find that the maximum complexity is, if I have n bits, I'll get some number that's order n because I just, I'm going to flip on uh, some number of bits in a generic state. I'm going to flip some number of bits that's of order n. Uh, and if I can, add, I can ask about the entropy, and again, I find an answer that's of order n. And so the, the complexity and the entropy in the, in the uh, classical context aren't really that different. But when we start thinking about quantum uh, bits or quantum qubits, you know, now I can have superpositions of all of the states in my favorite Hilbert space. And so if I start with some reference state here, and I'm acting with these simple gates, I, I have to introduce enough information to tell you what uh, some huge number of parameters are that, that characterize this state over here in the basis that I chose. And so there's, there's an exponential, well, it's just saying that the Hilbert space is exponentially large. Um, and so now when I uh, ask for the complexity, um, in fact, it's an exponential number in N, whereas when I ask for the maximum entropy. In fact, again, I'm getting a number of order n. And so in this particular case, when we went to the quantum situation, the complexity vastly, uh, or is just a huge number in, in comparison to the entropy. And so if I'm thinking, uh, as Lenny does, about black hole evolution as some kind of chaotic dynamics, um, by which I can just think in either one of these, well, let's think about this case. I've got my simple bit string and I'm going to throw random gates at it. Um, it'll take me towards some generic state. Um, and so both the entropy and the, the complexity will grow. But simply the fact that this number is so much bigger than that number means that I'm going to max out in the entropy long, long before I max out uh, in the complexity. And so that's, in this kind of a dynamics, I'm going to see that the system has quote unquote thermalized, i.e. the entropy is maximized long, long before the complexity. The complexity will continue to grow long after we've reached this maximum entropy. And so, yeah. I'm a little confused about your statement. Uh, psi is a function of time. Oh, no, 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 I meant, I meant that this was uh, some kind of evolution. So I'm, I'm, I'm now thinking of this as an evolution to new states. And so if I, in, if I, each time step, I throw a gate at whatever the state is. So I, I change the rules. I apologize. I, I, I have some simple starting point, and I'm going to throw a gate at it. It's a two-bit, two-bit gate. And so it's going to change the state and, and take me somewhere else. Um, and then in the next step, I throw another and another and another. 
And I start flipping, well, I started introducing various entanglements between different spins. And so I'm, this state is in my, at each time step, I'm getting a different state. But the claim is that it's becoming more and more complex, that it has, well, that there's more and more entanglement uh, in the system, just because I'm introducing more and more gates. When you say thermal lines, you don't mean with time, you mean with some other, I mean, you start with some chaotic system, you start with some initial state, and you wait some time, you don't mean that. Right, but, but, but my, my example of the chaotic was just randomly throwing my favorite gates at the, at the string of Qubit. <coughs> so that, that was my model for a chaotic dynamic in this particular simple concept. That's all. I, well, I, clearly I was trying to give you some intuition and I failed, at least in your case. I apologize. But the idea is that, in general, I should think that the complexity is in, in a system of qubits or in a quantum system, that the complexity is a much larger quantity, or, the, or that, in principle, the complexity can reach much larger value uh, than the entropy. And so in the, in the particular, in the context of the black holes, it's natural to think that, um, you know, the entropy or these measures, or in my experiment, I measured some entanglement entropy in the system. And that maxed out and, and stopped changing. But clearly the system was still changing. I mean, if I looked at the picture, the picture was still changing. Um, and so Lenny's idea was, well, here's a quantity that I can expect will grow long after the entropy is massive. That, that was the, well, that's part of, I, I think that was part of Lenny's intuition as to why I want to think about complexity in this particular context for the, his particular problem. So, so what does the law make complexity grow? I mean, no, the second law of complexity. Now, it, well, it, if you think, am I allowed to use my simple system to try and give you intuition or not? Okay. So, if, if I'm, so if I have these two qubit gates and they act, they're going to introduce some kind of entanglement. Like all of these spins here just spin down and there's no entanglement between them. If I act with a two qubit gate, I'm going to introduce some kind of entanglement in the system. Now, if I have a long string of qubits, and I'm just throwing random gates at it. In, for, for a very long time, the system's just going to get more and more complicated. I'd have to be really unlucky to throw a gate, or say the inverse gate, at a place where I'd applied a gate in the first place, at least at the early stages. And, and so there may be unlucky fluctuations in that dynamics that actually make the complexity drop down, but very rapidly it's going to go down. So, so it's, it's not a, a perfect, you know, straight line. There'll be little. There, there may be, uh, in a finite size system, you know, uh, very, uh, very small scale fluctuations as I grow. But in general, we expect that it will keep growing and growing as I wander out into the Hilbert space, some more interesting space. That's all. Okay. She appreciated. <laughs> Sorry, was there a question? Again, it was the idea that when I look at the picture, it looks like you know my my intent in my experiment, the single experiment that I did, it, that quantity stopped changing. But if I look behind the horizon, there's more and more space time for the you know. The space-time, as I push up, still continues to grow. It, it, you know, interesting things can happen. And so it's just this idea here that the complexity can continue to grow after the entropy is already maxed out. And so that, that was the idea that possibly this is an interesting, or, or this is a quantity that I expect to grow. And so if we were able to define complexity for our holographic system, I should see it continue to grow well after the entropy stops changing. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't know yet because you have all these lectures that are done, but the, what do we know, like on a certain ground, we, what do we know about the inside of the black hole? What do we know on 
of the inside. Oh, what can I reconstruct? Excellent question. I wish I could stay for Thursday, Dan, but uh, we'll find out about that on Thursday. Are you? I, and, I, well, okay, you haven't let me go to the next transparency, but he's going to propose two new observables in the, in the holographic theory that might be related to the complexity. Would you say that the effect that the complexity is so much louder than the maximum complexity is so much louder than the maximum entropy is somehow okay, a consequence of the quantum nature of this? Yes. So in, in, in classical systems, we don't expect that to have any effect. Ever. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that somebody could, or, but no, no, I'm not sure. It, it may be possible to contrive some classical system uh, where you get some kind of, uh, well, some kind of difference, but I, I'm not sure you could get exponential, but I, I don't know how creative, uh, I have a room full of creative people here. I challenge you, that's your exercise. <laughs> Can I go to the next transcript? I'm happy to answer questions. We've got a long way to go. Um, so as I said, Lenny just didn't say the slogan, holographic complexity. Um, he actually pointed to two new uh, gravitational observables or quantities that we could calculate in the holographic theory to, to probe this region behind the horizon. Um, and so the first one, I give the name complexity equals volume. And so what are we calculating there, or what did he suggest we calculate there? Well, it's uh, an operation that's very similar in spirit to holographic entanglement entropy. But in this case, what I'm doing is I pick the Cauchy surface, the entire Cauchy surface over here and over here, on which I imagine the state that I'm interested in lives. And then I'm supposed to find a co-dimension one surface that extends all the way through here. Uh, and then just like in uh, entanglement entropy, I extremize that geometry. And I take the extremal value as reflecting the complexity, or it's defined this quantity that I call C sub D. Now, um, this is a co-dimension one surface. In holographic entanglement entropy, we had co-dimension two, and so the dimension of my, what I call area, was equal to the dimension of the uh, Newton's constant, and that was giving us this nice dimensionless quantity, um, which we needed for the entropy. Here, the dimensions don't quite match up, and so I have to introduce some extra scale, and you know, Letty and his friends uh, <laughs> wring their hands about what that scale should be, for all practical purposes, any time that I show you the result of a calculation, what I've done is I've stuck the ADS scale in there. It's a natural scale that appears in our, our theory, but um, that's a choice that I made, or that had to be, uh, it's an extra little button or, or knob that had to be uh, tweaked when we came up with, when one does this calculation. On the other side, we have uh, complexity equals action. So in this case, we can think of, uh, well, we can think that this, ex if you want, we can focus our attention on that extremal surface or any Cauchy surface that runs between our two boundary uh, Cauchy surfaces. And then what I do is I look at the causal development or the domain of dependence of that Cauchy surface in the bulk that defines some region of the space-time. It's given a poetic name, wheeler de witt patch. Uh, and what I'm supposed to do in this procedure is I take that chunk of the space-time, I evaluate the gravitational action, uh, and for reasons that I may get to later, they threw in a pi and an h-bar. Uh, and then they called that, uh, well, they said again that that may reflect uh, the complexity of the corresponding boundary state. Um, I should add that there are subtleties in this, in that at the time that they made this proposal, they didn't have the tools 
that allowed them to actually calculate this action. Uh, but that is something that I'll, I'll mention later on in the talk. Um, by design, the reason that both of these make the transparency here is that both of these quantities naturally probe the interior. That is, they continue to evolve at arbitrarily late times as I push T left and T right up in my uh, boundary theory. Will this action get contributions from near the singularity? It would. Why don't you ask me later? Okay. Why don't you ask me, why, why should this have anything to do with complexity? Um, which I didn't explain. I explained what the observables are, but why did Lenny think this was, or these might be related to complexity and so on? I'll actually give you two reasons, and I'll say there's a third. There are other things that they'll call checks of this, these uh, conjectures, uh, but I think these are the main ones. Um, so the first for the complexity equals volume is there's a very nice story uh, about something called multi-scale entanglement or normalization and that. So what is that? That's a pretty way to draw pictures that describe how a condensed matter theorist might prepare a certain ground state of a complicated quant well, in it, actually it's not that complicated, it, it, it's some spin chain down here. But in that picture, what those, what those little blobs actually represent are unitary matrices. And so this really is a quantum circuit that one is describing uh, in preparing that particular state. There, there's been some suggestions or arguments, proposals in particular by Brian Swingle, that there's a connection between these networks or these quantum circuits and uh, holography. In particular, the suggestion is that this picture here actually gives a discrete representation of a time slice in my ADS space. So if I want to ask, you know, if I think this is the optimal way to prepare uh, that particular state, and I want to ask about complexity, well, what was I supposed to do? I was supposed to count the number of blobs or the number of gates, but that, according to this, Conjecture is just evaluating the volume of my uh, ADS slice. So that's essentially, or that's a set of conjectures, but it, it matches very well then with the idea of this extremal volume telling me about the complexity of the, uh, the associated boundary state. Um, there's uh, then the growth. So I mentioned this before, the reason these guys made the, or these observables made the cut is that they continue to grow long after the entropy maxed out. But in particular, you can argue um, that you expect the, the complexity to grow linearly, and it should grow with a pre, or the, the slope, or the rate of growth, should reflect the, the number of degrees of freedom and so that, that would be proportional, or the suggestion is that that should be proportional to the entropy. Um, it's a dimensional flow quantity, and so I need to stick some natural energy scale in there, and in the thermal system, the temperature is the natural energy scale. But then, of course, uh, for a CFT, at, in, in uh, well, I okay, still we'll ignore that, but for a CFT, um, the entropy times the temperature just gives us the energy of the system of the, some prefactors. And so direct calculations in the hol of the holographic observable said that at least at late times what you were seeing was a growth that was proportional to the mass. And so that then uh, matches up with these expectations here. I should also add, at least very briefly, that the authors of the complexity equals action paper were also enamored by their universal result. Here, you actually are looking at the high temperature limit to get that uh, M there. There can be, if you like, curvature corrections. You can ask me what that means. But in the, in the case of complexity equals action, you, you really got a result that it was proportional to the mass in any dimension. 
um, for any geometry on the boundary. Um, it was just given by that nice result. Um, and the authors there wanted to associate this with a bound that was put forward by Seth Lloyd in a particular model of computation, which said that the complexity should not be able to grow faster than the energy of the system. And in Seth's model, he had factors of 2 and pi. And that actually is why uh, the complexity in, in complexity equals action gets normalized by this extra factor of pi and then h bar if you're keeping track of that. Um, however, I, I, I want to mention that because if you go read the paper, you'll see that. And it's, it's a, uh, discussed extensively. However, it's also true that the bound is not a bound. It's violated. Uh, and I'll, I may rush by a calculation later on in the lecture uh, where I show you that I get a time rate of change that's actually bigger than the math. Um, so, so that's just a warning for people who want to go read the literature that you shouldn't pay too much attention to that part of the discussion, but it's really a small part. It's not really important for uh, the rest of the idea. Um, the last one has to do with out-of-time order correlators. I'm not going to try and explain that. But it, it, it just has to do with throwing shock waves, or in the holographic side, it has to do with throwing shock waves at the black hole and seeing how these various observables change when you do that. Uh, and again, it's in line with expectations. Um, what I wanted to do uh, next was go back to just mention the subtleties that are involved uh, in the action calculation. Um, we all know what the, or I hope we all know, uh, what the action for gravity is. It's just the uh, Einstein-Hilbert action, and we have to throw in a negative cosmological constant when we're doing ADS-CFD. But from the perspective of field theory, of course, this is a very unusual action, in that if I start to unwrap this, uh, Richie Scaler, in terms of the metric, I, I start by writing out second derivative terms. And so my action actually contains second derivatives, um, which puts the boundary value problem in jeopardy, because we'd like to have a boundary value problem uh, where we're fixing the metric, um, but we're not putting any constraints on, say, derivatives of the metric away from our initial surface or, or our boundary surface. Of course, there's a simple solution, and that ha and that's simple or illustrated with the, a simple analogy. I could write the action for a scalar field, just a free massless scalar field, like this, phi box phi. Um, that has exactly this problem here. If I try and do the variation of that action, I'll see that there are boundary terms that involve both the variation of phi and uh, derivatives. And so I can't consistently, with that alone, set up uh, a, a boundary value problem or, or a proper uh, action principle. But I know that the solution is that I should just add a boundary term. And then the variations of this boundary term are going to cancel the variations of the normal derivative of delta phi at, uh, that I picked up and integrated by parts here. And the reason I know that that's the right boundary term to add is because, of course, I can just integrate by parts now and get back the conventional action. And so that's just a short story to tell you that, of course, in the case of gravity, where we're guided by uh, geometry, we want this very nice action that has a beautiful geometric or an elegant geometric interpretation. But that's not going to be enough. We're going to have to supplement that action with some surface terms. And luckily, somebody has done that for us long, long ago. It was originally Jimmy York, and then also Gibbons and Hawking came to the same conclusion that I should add uh, to the boundary some term that's proportional to the trace of the extrinsic curvature. And so that's some quantity that has to do with dragging the normal vector around on this boundary. Um, again, it has some elegant geometric interpretation. But the claim is that um, with, those, with that combination of bulk and boundary uh, terms, that we have a nice uh, boundary value problem or uh, action principle for gravity. 
Now, as I brought in, however, and, and as I'm supposed to explain now, that boundary term applies for time-like and space-like surfaces. But at certain places, they're going to run into each other, or I might have segments, say these two space-like segments, that run uh, and have intersections, i.e. there might be corners there. And you, you have to work a little bit harder when they're in, to take care of these corners, and there are some extra boundary terms that Sean Hayward worked out and you can think that, well, if this had to do with dragging the normal along that surface, well, it suddenly jumps at this point. And so this eta has to do, well, as in this example, has to do with that jump in the normal vector. These are the two normal vectors to this surface on that side of the corner and that well, on the uh, other side of the corner. And it, in fact, the rules are more complicated. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of different types of corners. Um, but, but Sean's taking care of that, and we don't have to worry about that. However, in the picture, I now have covered the top of my piece of space-time, but I specifically drew a piece of space-time that has no boundaries. And given that action, we don't know what to do with the no boundaries. Um, and that's going to be important for us, because in the wheeler width path, um, just by its construction, most of the boundaries are going to end up being null. And so we better work a little bit harder, and that's what I did with some friends, to come up with some extra boundary terms to take care of uh, the case when some of the segments of the boundary uh, are null. And also their intersections with each other or with other uh, time one or space one. And so you have to add a couple of extra terms. Again, this has to do with dragging the normal vector around on that surface, and this has to do with uh, the jump in the normal vector as you go around the corner. Um, but then given that, we've now got a, uh, an interesting action. But you might ask, well, you know, why can't I add more boundary terms? Uh, so in, in a simple example is an ADS C, CFT. There's a standard set of boundary terms that we add out of infinity um, that you can think of as counter terms in the field theory. They take care of various divergences that appear when you try and integrate out the action to the asymptotic boundary. Um, it turns out that they're not relevant. I couldn't be more creative. I could, you know, add total derivatives. Those aren't going to change the equations of motion as long as I'm careful. They're not going to change the boundary value problem either. Um, so I could be very creative in different ways in changing that action. But I'm simply going to stop. I'm going to work with that particular action or suggest that you work with that particular action. And I'm going to say that, well, perhaps this is just a reflection of those ambiguities that I talked about in circuit you know, we can add more stuff, and perhaps that's like changing the microscopic rules in some particular way. Um, but we've got to start somewhere, and so let's start with this action. Um, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. I went too fast. So kappa was, is, so I'm adding that along, uh, I'm integrating that along the null boundary. But it's defined by this equation here, where k is the normal vector to the boundary. So k is a normal, uh, or is a null vector in this particular case. It's the, the null normal, say, to this surface right here. Okay, so, so these lines, the normal is space-like. Those two lines, the, the normal is um, time-like. You might, or, or perhaps what you're asking is, well, can I take a limit where I perhaps take a, uh, uh, a time-like surface like that and boost it over and make it a null surface? And can I just take the limit of the extrinsic curvature? And the answer is you can, and then you can get whatever answer you want because it's actually ambiguous. The, the limit isn't well defined. And so 
it's easier, or well, easier. Uh, a, a, a proper net or, or another, uh, what we did is we just worked directly with the null surface. We looked at the variation of the action. We saw what needed to be there to take care of the appropriate surface terms uh, in varying the action. And it turns out that it's related, again, to dragging the normal vector around on that null surface. But it has a little, I mean, we can talk more if you want later about the technical details. Are there other questions? Okay, having said I have this beautiful action, um, in fact, it is ambiguous in itself. When I vary it, I know that those terms uh, give me the appropriate variations to cancel the surface terms. But if I try and evaluate it on shell the way I'm supposed to do, I can make different choices and get different answers. In particular, what this equation is saying is how much the geodesics along the null, the null generators of these null surfaces, how much they fail to be a, a finely parameterized. That is, I can change this lambda, and that changes uh, the kappa. And in particular, a simple choice, which I advocate, is that you can just choose the generators to be a finely parameterized, which means that I get the set kappa equals zero. That's a great choice because that means then I don't have to worry about this term when I'm evaluating the action. Again, it would vary if I vary the action, but when I'm evaluating it on shell, I get to make that choice and just throw it away. It doesn't make a contribution. Um, another point here, though, is that this is actually a dimensionable quantity, and so I could make all sorts of different choices, but I don't want to make different choices that are particular to a given geometry. Because again, what I'd like to do is evaluate complexities for lots of different states and compare them. And to be able to do that, I want to have a definition or a set of definitions that, that don't make an intrinsic a reference to a given state. So for example, I don't want to stick a mass in there because that would be like changing the complexity rules for states with different energy. Would this be the complexity that a certain observer sees? No, but let's talk about that later. Um, there are other ambiguities, but given that time is running, um, I'll just say that you, you know, there are simple choices you can make to fix the ambiguities that, that appear here. Um, and then given this technology, we can actually properly evaluate the time rate of change of the complexity. And much to the surprise of my collaborators, you get exactly the same answer that the smart folks at Stanford said it should be. Um, and then what you can do is you can change, uh, you know, the choices that we made here and ask how does that answer change? And so you can change the normalization of the null vector and in fact it doesn't change it at all. I can change this constant here and it doesn't change the answer at all. Or you can change that kappa, and again, it doesn't change it at all. The caveat being that I'm not allowing for arbitrary changes. I mean, if I, if I stuck a time-dependent number here, uh, in fact, I could get whatever answer I wanted, but there's no sense to doing that. Again, I'm making choices that allow meaningful comparisons. Um, so for example, if I allow this normalization to be an arbitrary constant, um, I'm not changing uh, the, the, the rate of growth of the complexity. Um, boom. Luckily, my eyes are bad enough that I can't see that. So. <laughs> Just two minutes. Uh, <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, well, okay, uh, well, I'll just carry on and you can stop me whenever you get bored. Um, <laughs> is that now? Um, you know, I, I talked about the big ambiguity within the context of complexity equals action, but already we've seen that there's some kind of ambiguity. I mean, I was given two different prescriptions to evaluate the, the, the complexity of my holographic states. 
And, you know, already I'm seeing that, well, in the previous example where this number didn't change, or in this example where, where I'm seeing a mass and a linear growth with time, uh, that there are uh, questions, or there is some robust information here, but that we, again, we're going to have to be careful uh, and see where these ambiguities uh, may uh, creep out and stop us from getting more refined answers. Um, what's another calculation you can do? Well, you can calculate... Actually, I don't want to calculate this. You can look at the slides later. Um, now that's still the same thing. Uh, I'll show you this slide. So, one of the things you can do, I, I focused on the rate of growth of the complexity at wait time. But, you know, given this technology and smart grad students and postdocs, uh, you can calculate the time rate of growth in general. And so I wrote down the simplest example, which is for a two-dimensional boundary theory. And uh, that means I'm, I'm looking at a BTZ black hole here. Um, but what you find is uh, this formula here. There's a, a nice formula. It's got a 2m over pi, and then it's got some extra time-dependent stuff. Uh, with, well, you know, the, there's the time times the temperature there and the time times the temperature there. But I, I want to focus our attention on this log uh, for a moment, because it's got two annoying things in it. One is that alpha is just some number. Remember I said before that, you know, I had to choose the normalization of these null normals in a particular way. And, and so this was an arbitrary choice that I got to make. And it turns out that that arbitrary choice comes up and uh, sneaks into the final answer when we look at this more refined quantity. Um, the other thing that happens is if I stare at that answer, that L is the L that you expect, namely it's the ADS scale. But I wrote this as the answer to a question in the boundary theory, in the CFT. But the CFT doesn't know about the ADS scale, and so it's rather annoying that the ADS scale appears in my answer. And I'm not going to end, or I'm not going to address that. I'm going to wait two seconds. But the one thing, if we if we ignore those details, if we look at what the leading correction for that 2m is, that wait time, you find that all of that reduces down to this expression here, where there's a, a time and an exponential here, but in particular there's a plus sign here. And so what that means is that at late times this is approaching this answer that they wanted, 2m over pi, but it's approaching it from above. And so in fact at any time other than infinity the time rate of growth of the complexity is in fact bigger than 2m over and so you shouldn't, well, that's why I was urging you to read the Lloyd Bound and then skip right along. Um, it, 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 there seem to be issues there. Um, that's not the case. Well, they didn't claim any kind of Lloyd Bound for that, but that's not the case in complex people's volume. Um, OK, so Lenny focused our attention on looking at the deep infrared behind the black hole. I want to take a moment and look at what's happening out in the UV end. Again, these quantities are integrated out to infinity, and so they naturally diverge. But there's the natural way of regulating that, which is don't integrate all the way to infinity. Instead, we introduce some cutoff surface at some large radius, which introduces the cutoff in the boundary theory. Uh, when you do that, you get answers that look, well, complicated when I write them that way, but this looks very much like what I got in, in holographic entanglement entropy. I get this leading term is the area of, or, or the, the volume of my time slice. Remember before we had the area of the entangling surface over the cutoff of the appropriate power. And then I get curvature corrections to that. Again, they're integrals over the, uh, the time slice multiplied by some curvature. And so I failed to correct that power. That should be d minus 3. So, so the biggest difference here is that um, 
if I'm in an even dimensional boundary theory, the entanglement entropy have even dimensional powers, and, and perhaps logs here, the complexity has odd dimensional or odd powers, and I have to go to odd dimensions to find the logs. Um, so that was complexity equals volume. It turns out that the complexity equals action, the story is more or less the same. However, these null vectors do something interesting at infinity. And so you should think of this as a term that is volume plus curvature corrections. And this is volume times curvature corrections. But there's a prefactor here that's got a log of the ADS scale over alpha times delta. And so that actually looks like it's diverging more rapidly. Um, but again, has these annoying features that the ADS scale appear there, as well as the normalization of our null vectors. You can put those together, actually, as a virtue. And you can say that what I should do is I should pick alpha to be the ADS scale over L, some new scale. And so that gets rid of the ADS scale and turns this into a CFD question. But that L then has to be a scale in the CFT. What scale should I choose? Well, you, it could be related to the volume of the system, but now my complexity would be super extensive. I mean, it would grow faster than the volume. Alternatively, it could be related to the cutoff scale. That appears in any problem. But what that means then is that there are IR contributions, for example, this, uh, this time rate of growth would depend on the cutoff, uh, even though it's sort of an IR contribution. Alternatively, I could just pick some random scale and say that's the complexity scale. Um, and, and then I've just got this random scale appearing in my answer. So at this point, we were just left wringing our hands. But hopefully, if I go a little quicker tomorrow, I'll, I'll illustrate why that is actually a feature, not a bug of our holographic calculation. Uh, this brings us to the end, uh, which is just to say that, again, this is sort of a, a fruitful field, or it's a new field. It's a field where there are lots of questions. Uh, the first question would be, what the heck are we talking about? Um, what does this holographic complexity really mean? What is it dual to in the boundary theory? Although I promise Lenny, no matter what it's dual to, we're going to call it complexity. Um, but, but we don't really know what it is that we're, we're calculating. It has certain properties uh, that we might assume or associate with complexity. But we should have we, a proper entry in the ADS CFT dictionary that says, evaluate this volume, and you're doing this in the boundary theory. Um, there are lots of other questions, but I'll uh, stop at this point and open it up again to questions. Sorry, you still didn't get how you could reliably compute something in the singular. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, you can. Uh, the longer answer is that you can. Um, all, all we do is you introduce some regulator surface, um, and you, in fact, you add a boundary term there. You, you evaluate the action up to the regulator surface and let the regu let it wander into R equals zero, and that produces a finite result. But I, I agree that it's very annoying that the, the singularity is contributing in a finite way, and uh, perhaps that's one of the questions that one should ask. Um, it, it seems that there's a deeper story there and that you can look at lots of different kinds of black holes with all sorts of different matter fields, and different kinds of singularities, and it, you never, it, you never, it never produces divergences. Um, and so it seems that there must be a way that, that although our computation, you know, directly references the, the singularity, that, that that, that must be, or well, one perspective is that that might be a fake, that there's a better way to do the computation, which doesn't go up and test the thing Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Um, I'll, I'll give you the 
answer I think that you're expecting, uh, which is no. But then the entanglement entropy wasn't either. Uh, and the entanglement proved to be a useful diagnostic that in certain fields, people practically apply it. Um, the condensed matter theorists already apply it, or, or an equivalent uh, concept, in differentiating different phases of their, their favorite spin chain. Um, and so I, I yeah, I, well, I understand where the question's coming from, but I, I'm, I'm not put off uh, by it. I, I think that there will be utility in pursuing this particular direction. And uh, did you expect the uh, neat formula, just like the entanglement entropy for the complexity? Say that again? Do you expect that we'll be able to find a neat way to compute the complexity, just like the entanglement entropy? A neat way? Like um, a simple formula, a useful formula? You, you mean in the quantum field theory, or in yeah, it's, it's, um, for that you have to wait for my comments at the very end of tomorrow's lecture? If you have the finger, or whoever the chair. Okay. Oh, you to um, well, ultimately, I think that was part of Lenny's goal, right? He wants to understand what's going on behind the horizon. So it, it's related, or well, presumably, understand, having a better grasp of behind the horizon. 